In the fall of 1987, local news channel WSB-TV2 of Atlanta, Georgia was attempting to fill a scheduling gap in their Sunday morning lineup. After a few solicitations by local business owners, they decided to allow the young Reverend Marley Sachs to take the available hour block to do a religiously themed show. It premiered on October 18th with little promotion. The show was standard religious fare and consisted of the Reverend sitting in a simple chair, reading passages from the Bible to the camera, and discussing their interpretation and significance to our modern, day-to-day -day life. The show received a reasonable number of views, and continued to be shown into early December. It was then that the studio began to receive extremely strange complaints from viewers of Words of Light with the Reverend Marley Sachs. The calls were from women, and women only, who vaguely referred to uncomfortable feelings they had at very specific intervals during the program. They described feelings of nausea, back pain, dizziness, and blurred vision. These callers, for no discernible reason, were convinced that it was the viewing of this program that was causing these symptoms. It was later determined after three weeks of complaints that these feelings were happening at roughly 12 minute intervals during the course of the program. The small studio staff checked all recording equipment, both audio and video, and found nothing faulty. When the Reverend was made aware of these incidents, he merely shrugged and stated, cryptically, that some can't handle the voice of God. The head of the studio, at a loss to explain the cause of these complaints, decided to continue running the program. By February, viewership had dropped sharply and it was decided to pull the plug on the show. The studio had figured it would be more prudent to spend as much time as possible on the news story that had two other local news networks abuzz. The miscarriage epidemic. Starting sometime in November, the number of healthy pregnant women miscarrying in the Atlanta metropolitan area had reached over 300. The CDC could find no discernible cause for this terrifying occurrence. The Reverend took the show's cancellation with what could only be described as abject indifference. When informed, he made no protest, merely nodded, almost knowingly. He left the studio after the last episode was filmed without so much as a word and dropped off the face of the earth. No one ever heard from him again, not his former congregation or any member of the church. The studio moved on, filling the slot with an infomercial and continued to concentrate on the miscarriage story. A year and a half later, an intern at WSB Studios discovered the tapes of The Words of Light and began going through them in an attempt to find stock footage for an upcoming piece the station was doing on the impact religion had on the city. The Atlanta incident, as the miscarriage epidemic became known in medical journals, petered out three months after the studio canceled Reverend Sack's show and had already begun to fade from the public consciences. As the intern went through the tapes, he accidentally made a disturbing discovery about the footage. While attempting to stop one recording at 10 minutes 45 seconds, he mistakenly jammed the fast forward button down. While the footage whizzed by, he attempted to pry up the button with a screwdriver. Just as he succeeded, the tape stopped at 32 minutes, one second. The intern actually fell out of his chair when he looked up at what was frozen on the screen. The image of a badly decomposed, severed head filling up the entire frame. After he collected himself, he moved the film back a few frames, then forward and realized that his mind was not playing tricks on him. He began going through the rest of the recording and soon discovered that at exactly 12 minute intervals, the image would appear for one frame. Thinking it was some practical joke being played on the new guy, he presented it to one of the film technicians, ready to be mocked. The technician was just as puzzled as him. 
No one had touched the footage since the cancellation of the show. After the studio had closed for the night, the intern convinced the tech to help him go through all the tapes of the words of light. They discovered that every single episode had this same horrifying anomaly. They also realized that as the show progressed, the image had become more disgusting, as maggots began to eat away at the loose flesh and pieces of hair and skin seemed to have fallen off exponentially. The tech made clear to the intern that what they were seeing was technically impossible, since the film itself showed absolutely no signs of splicing, and he himself had been at every filming of the show and knew of no time when this image could have been inserted into the frame. All of this was presented to the studio head, who, fearing some kind of backlash over allowing this to get on the air, ordered all the tapes destroyed. He told the intern and tech that he had no interest in knowing who did it at this point, only that covering their collective asses is all that's important now. He demanded that they mention this to no one. The tech easily moved on, remembering the incident as a darkly funny personal anecdote, but the intern wouldn't let it go. He made copies of as many tapes as he could before they were wiped and took them to see if he could find anything else in them that might point to who did this or why they would. A week later, he attempted to rope the tech into helping him again saying that he believed he had discovered something even more disturbing than the images themselves. When the single frames were edited together in chronological order, the head's mouth appeared to be moving as if trying to form words. The tech, fearing for his job, told him to get rid of the copies and to not talk about it again. A week later, Police responded to a 911 call made by an elderly woman in one of the Atlanta suburbs at dusk. She had heard horrible noises coming from her next door neighbor's house, where a young couple lived. She told the emergency responder that the wife was pregnant and that she was terrified that something had happened. When the officers arrived on the scene 20 minutes later, they found no lights on in the windows and the front door ajar. They moved in slowly and made their way into the living room. Inside, they found a young woman, dead, with her abdomen slashed open. The wound was jagged and a trail of blood led from the body to the couch on the far end of the room. There sat her husband, the studio intern, naked, the corpse of his unborn child at his feet, dying. In his hand, he held the rusty piece of metal siding he had used to gut his pregnant wife. The television was on, and playing an 18 second loop of silent footage of a decomposing head, mouthing some unintelligible words. The story at the police precinct to this day, goes that the intern kept saying under his breath, over and over again, as they led him away. The light of God calls them. Good evening, everyone. I am your host, Paradox Noctis, filling in for that creepy reading tonight. And what can be said about this lovely little story? Well, for starters, I believe it accomplishes its goal. The build-up is nice, it doesn't go too quickly, except for probably around the end, when things just kind of jump to a rather gruesome conclusion, but we'll get to that in a moment. The story starts out about a simple local religious TV show, when it devolves into something more gruesome and something much more unsettling. We have our character, the Reverend Marley Sachs, who's seemingly distant, very detached from everything that's going on when the complaints start rolling in about a show no less from only women which is odd that would seem like something that would set off the average person but it doesn't seem to be the case with reverend Sachs. the only problem i have with marley Sachs at this point though is that 
he's seemingly only a plot device. Whereas his show is cancelled and he's just never heard from again. Seems like something that might raise up some red flags, but perhaps I'm overthinking it. I mean, it's still within the realm of plausibility, so I suppose it's alright. When you're looking at a creepypasta like this, you want some plausibility. Another thing that this creepypasta I felt did right was the fact that it plays on the trope of antiquated media formats, such as local TV stations or VHS tapes. That's where things get out of the realm of plausibility, I believe. The older a format of media, or just anything in general, is, we tend to make it creepier. It's just one of the things about our society that we see older things as more frightening for some reason. Probably the only other complaint I have about this creepypasta is it plays on the tro- it plays on what I'm going to call the I am God trope. Basically, it all comes back to God, I believe. You get creepypastas like Sonic.exe with the line I am God, you get creepypastas like a gateway of the mind with the whole I've spoken with God, he's abandoned us trope. It just all seems a bit contrived to me. Like it seems a bit forced. I don't want to call it a pot shot, a religion per se, but whenever one includes uh, any kind of religion in a horror movie, more often than not it's a pot shot at the church. More often than not, it's just a pot shot at organized religion in general, but that's a topic for a different day. Uh, overall, I think this creepypasta accomplished its goal. It's built up well, aside from the ending where it just jumps into this completely gruesome scene where the intern has murdered his wife and essentially his unborn child, all because of the subliminal messaging that's put off through the Reverend's TV series, but other than that, I think the group of Boston accomplished its goal. It unsettled me. Did it unsettle you? Leave a comment. Start a discussion. That's what that whole section beneath the video is for. But overall, this was a decent creepy Boston. Hope you guys enjoyed.